Good afternoon. Before this week's episode of My Money Cast by My Bank, I wanted to take a moment to read something on behalf of all of us at My Bank regarding the brutal murder of George Floyd. My Bank is, and always has been, committed to providing equality of opportunity for all young people and staff, regardless of race, gender, or background. Recent events show us how precious that level playing field is, that the struggle is real and constant, and that when we see wrong, we call it out and redouble our efforts to right it. My bank abhors violence in any form and anywhere. Black lives do matter. A financially capable young person is a powerful force to help create a more equal society. And my bank will continue to be relentless in our mission to forge that generation, no matter who is in it. They say knowledge is power. Let's be powerful together. To start the show. Good afternoon and welcome to episode six of the My Money Cast by My Bank. This week we're looking at all things consumer rights, especially because the shops are now starting to open back up. You might need to know what your rights are about returns and all those kind of things. My name is Nick Smith Patel. I'm the head of education for young adults. And as always, I'll be your host for the show. If you want to get involved, send us anything, uh, join on our social medias, ask a chat a question. Feel free to do that today. But you can join us here at all these social media platforms every week, live at 4 p.m., uh, not just the one that you're currently watching on right now. And we also keep all our recordings recorded on YouTube, uh, on IGTV. We have a series on there. Uh, and you can also find it if you go back through on Twitter. So live broadcasting every week, 4 p.m. Feel free to send us anything over. And if you do want to send us an email about anything we talk about today, or just to reach out and say hello, to send us anything you want us to show, feel free to put it in at info at mybank.org. And as always, we're going to start with our roundup of the week's news you might have missed around money. So let's go to Heads Up. So, first of all, some good news, apparently. Britons have managed to pay off, let me get this right, £7.4 billion pounds from loans and credit cards in just one month as lockdown spending has fallen since we've been in this lockdown period. <clears throat> Excuse me. The closure of shops, pubs, restaurants means that there's less temptation for people to spend now. Where are we going to go and spend our money? There's nowhere to go and spend it. Also, people are worried about potential unemployment, a recession. So those things combined to mean that this month, five million, sorry, billion pounds was paid off credit cards. Uh, 2.4 billion on other debts such as loans, car finance, that kind of stuff. And that's double what was done in March, which is 3.8 billion. Um, and that was a record as well. So there's a, qu a quote here that I wanna show you from uh, Josie Dent, who's an econom uh, economist. economist. Uh, the heightened economic uncertainty combined with a near elimination of spending on items such as holidays has made consumer appetite for debt for those who can avoid it extremely limited so we're saying you know people don't want to take debt it's uncertain so you don't want to take the risk but also big expenses like yearly holidays that haven't been done means that more people have got more money in their pocket to spend on debt so have you managed to save money in the lockdown i know i've been spending less on takeaways because less temptation when i walk past on the way to work so one of the pieces of good news coming out is uh 7.4 billion saved and potentially might be in your pocket as well Next one. You may have seen this if you recognize my voice on TV, but I managed to get on the briefing, the five o'clock briefings uh, with the government and asked a question around what do we think is going to happen with young people after the coronavirus recession has uh, finished. So I'm going to play this. This is taken from Monday's live briefing uh, and my question was just picked at random. So here you go. We'll now go straight to questions. The first question uh, from uh, the first questions are from the public and the first question is from Nick from London on video. Nick. With the coronavirus sending us into a deep recession that's likely to hurt the prospects of many school leavers and young people, what is the government planning to do to address this? Well, thanks, Nick. That's a, uh, a very, very important question. As well as the health response, we take very seriously the economic response, especially towards those who are starting out in their careers, as you've mentioned, school leavers and young people, but actually right across the board. The amount of economic support that we've put into the economy is unprecedented, with the furlough scheme one of the most generous in the world and the direct support for businesses, because our judgment is that it's best to keep businesses up and running as much as is possible. We can't save everyone 
but keep them up and running as much as possible, therefore to keep the jobs there for people to go back to as we get through this crisis. But it's also true that the economy is going to have to change. We're going to have to need a different type of economy as we come out of this, and you'll be hearing more of that from the Chancellor and the Prime Minister who have been working so hard on getting this right uh, in, the, uh, in the weeks and months to come. It's an incredibly important question. We want to support the economy. We've put that financial support in, but we've got to make sure that the opportunities are there as well. A different type of economy could be interesting. And maybe we need to keep an eye on the news in the next weeks and months to see exactly what it is Boris Johnson and uh, his team have to say about the future of finances for young people. So keep your ear to the ground, and we will, of course, be keeping you updated on any financial news every week that we hear as well. Lastly, you know, I like to finish with something that's free. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a crafty person. I do origami and that kind of stuff. If you like crafty stuff like that, you might be into this. This is uh, Canon Creative Park. So this is the website. You can see it down at the below. It's uh, creativepark.canon. And the idea is that these are all paper models. You can make all of this just by using your printer, uh, a pair of scissors and some glue and I've done a few of these myself I've actually made this dragon this is one I spent about a day doing uh, really really simple you can make toys 3d models all that kind of stuff you go to the website you have a free sign up you can even make things as delicate as cars and and buildings and you download a PDF like this it comes with full instructions all the parts you need all you need to do print that out set it up get a pair of scissors and off you go and you can make some paper crafts so if you're bored Paper craft might be a way to keep yourself going. It takes a fair while to do them, so it's a good long project for you, especially on a long weekend, especially because the weather isn't getting that good and we might be forced back inside anyway. So that's our roundup of the news for this week. Let's keep it going and get into our big topic for the week. So what are we talking about? We are talking about consumer rights. And the first question before we get started on any of that is what am I talking about? What are consumer rights? Well, consumer rights are the rights you have in law when you spend money. Now, you can briefly split consumer rights into two kind of halves, uh, goods and services, and we're going to break down a little bit about both now. Uh, obviously, with lockdown, a lot of people started to do online shopping, and there are some slightly different rules about that. We'll go through those. But as shops open, and more and more people might be tempted to go out shopping and go to a, a brick-and-mortar store, it's good to know your rights. So let's go through some of them now. First of all, what are your rights when it comes to buying goods? I'm going to show you some PDFs that I found on the Citizen Advice website, which are really great for breaking down your individual rights for each different scenario. Uh, it might be a bit hard to see on Instagram Live because I know we're on a smaller window, so my apologies. Catch us on the catch up. Otherwise, I'll take you through it now. So first of all, if you buy a good in a shop, as opposed to online or over the phone, there are slightly different rules. So if you bought something in a shop, the rule that we're talking about here is the Consumer Rights Act 2015, and it says a few things. It must be as described, fit for purpose, satisfactory quality. If that thing fails and is faulty in the first 30 days, you can take it back to where you bought it from. And that doesn't matter what they tell you. No, it's not our responsibility. You need to take it back to whoever makes the product. If it's in the first 30 days, it goes back to the person who sold it to you. If it's up to six months later, if it can't be repaired or replaced, then you're entitled to a full refund in most cases. And up to six years later, if the goods do not last a reasonable length of time, you might be entitled to some money back. Now, the big difference if you buy online, if you buy at home or over the phone, is after getting your goods, you have 14 days to change your mind, get a full refund. It doesn't have to be because the item is faulty you can just go i don't like it and i'll explain why that might be important in just a sec now the last thing briefly is digital content if you're buying download stuff games that kind of thing again you have 14 days to change your mind but if you have downloaded the content normally that means that you've accepted it and that 14 days may not apply again if your content is faulty you're entitled to repair or replacement of that content so if you download a game it doesn't work they have to send you another file that does work if the fault can't be fixed or it hasn't been fixed within a decent and reasonable amount of time uh and it, it, you know you haven't had to put in loads of effort to get it done then you can get some of your money back you didn't have had to do it if you can show that the fault however has caused damage if you download a game for example and it breaks your pc you might be entitled to a repair or compensation because there wasn't reasonable care and skill. So that's the kind of summary of, of the goods aspect. And you might be wondering, well, why the online uh, system? Why, why is it different if I buy online? Well, take this pen, for example. If I say this pen is in a shop, what can you do with this pen in a shop you can't do online? Pick it up. 
can't look at it. You can't check it. What if I've been really crafty with my photos and I've put it really close to the camera so it looks like a massive pen and when you get it, it's actually very, very small. That it's a way to protect you for buying online in case there's anybody being a little bit dodgy out there who are trying to scam you. Because actually, I remember at one point there was a, a really clever scam going around on eBay before this rule kind of like was, was massively known and people were selling, uh, what was it? All natural pest, uh, pest control. Uh, guaranteed to kill any insect on contact. And when you paid your £25 for this miracle thing, it was two blocks of wood labelled A and B. And the instructions were, put the fly on A, hit with block B, repeat. In that case, because you bought online, you can go, well, actually, this is ridiculous, and send it back for a full refund. If you were in a shop, you could, of course, go, well, this is not what I'm paying for, and refuse to buy it in the first place. So there are slightly different rules, um, and that does also carry through services. So... Faulty came up there, the word faulty, and we talked about what a product needs to be in order to be not faulty. Let's go through that in a bit more detail using a nice acronym that I found on Money Saving Expert. So, uh, faulty items, if anything on this checklist applies to your item, but if anything doesn't apply to this item, if anything's broken here, you could say the item is faulty, and if it's faulty, you are entitled to all those things we just talked about. So, first and foremost, this is the way to remember it. It's sad fart. And it stands for this. An item must be of satisfactory quality. It has to be of a quality that's good enough for what it's meant to do. It has to be as described. If I order a blue car and a red one turns up, it doesn't matter if the car works. It's not as it was described to me, I can return that. It has to be fit for the purpose for which it was made. If I buy an umbrella and it's got a hole in it, what is the point? I can get a refund. And it needs to last a reasonable length of time. The problem is what's reasonable? And it, it differs from thing to thing. So, for example, think about a pair of trainers you might have bought. How long would you reckon a pair of trainers would be reasonably expected to last for? What about your car? What about your laptop? Everything's going to have these slightly different terms. So it's, it's no hard and fast rule about time. But sad part's really important, just understanding that when something's faulty, you have a legal right to return. Now, I should say, if it doesn't meet those criteria, let's say you bought something and you decide is not quite right or you didn't get the size right you actually don't have any legal right to return that and you're relying on what we call store policy now now if a store has a policy saying you can return within this number of days that's your right to do so but a lot of stores will be very specific about things for example hygiene you're normally not allowed to take underwear back once you've worn it earrings and piercings that kind of stuff sometimes mattresses can cause that issue as well so do make sure you check the terms with the shop you're buying from if you're not sure if you want to keep it or not um, if, if you know that it's a case that you want this thing and it's faulty, always go for the refund. The other thing to talk about briefly is market stalls. Sometimes you'll see market stalls saying no refunds. I'm allowed to do that. If an item is faulty, it has to be refunded or replaced or, ret uh, or um, fixed if that's what you want. So make sure, understand those rules. Um, and if you're talking to anyone in a shop and a shopkeeper doesn't agree with you, ask for a manager. Nine times out of ten, once you bring a manager in and explain the rights, nice and calmly, nice and cool and collective, this is what I expect, nine times out of ten, it will go the right way. If you start asking for things that aren't in law, and one of those examples is the price on the shelf, you might find that you don't get what you want. There is no legal right in this country for you to demand the price that is on the shelf if it turns out that that price is wrong. You can say that it's well, misleading if it's been there for 24 hours, but you can't demand that price. It's one of the few things that people get wrong all the time. Um, so something to bear in mind. Now that's goods. What about services? What do I mean by services? Well, have you ever had a bad haircut? I, I know I have. The question is, did you pay for it? Because a lot of people will say, yes, I paid for a bad haircut because we feel like if the hairdresser's done any work to our hair, then they deserve some payment. Not always true. Take a look. In terms of services, you're right. If you pay for a service in a shop, you have to be expect them to repeat or fix the service if it's not carried out with reasonable care and skill. If you just take a blade to my head and mess up my hair, that's not reasonable care and skill. And if you can't fix it, I should get my money back. If you haven't agreed a price before the service started, what you're asked to pay must be reasonable. And again, that's that word again, reasonable and what reasonable is. And if you haven't agreed a time frame for that service, it again, has to be carried out in a reasonable length of time. Now, if you order a service online, it's the same thing. You have that 14-day cooling-off period. 
to, to call and, and to cancel. Now, one thing I will say is that at one point I heard a, a bit of a ruse. There were people going around door to door. And what they were doing is they were signing people up for services at the door, kind of doing a quick sell here, sign this. And then when people were trying to call them, the phones weren't being answered for 14 days. So it is one of those things always, you know, make sure you read your contracts before you sign them. But do know that if you do it over the phone or on the internet, phone contracts, for example, if you, if you sign up for a phone contract over the phone or over the internet, you have that 14 day cooling off period. Um, yeah, the more you know about this sort of stuff, the less likely it is you're going to be affected by it in a negative way. Uh, the other thing about services is holidays counts as a service. Um, catering counts as a service. So, for example, if you've had a, a, a wedding cancelled and you had a catering service, you might have paid money out and, and now faced with a situation where you, you don't know what's going on with getting your money back. So let's talk about that. Coronavirus, how does it affect your rights? Short answer, it shouldn't. There's no actual law, and we might have to ask the expert about this because he may know better than I do. But as far as I'm aware, there's no special law that's been enacted to change any of the consumer rights laws that we see during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So one of the things that's happened is travel. A lot of travel companies are meant to be refunding people, and it is meant to be within 14 days, but some of them physically aren't able to. So there's law, and then there's the ability to meet the law, and that, I think, is causing some of the confusion. Um, and also some of the hardship for a lot of people. People are waiting for these refunds because they need the cash. But if the companies don't have the money, it's really hard for them to, to be able to do that all in one go. So it might be having to be more, more patient, for example. Um, there are a couple of things to talk about in terms of if you have a cancellation and you need to try and claim it back. We'll talk about that afterwards. But before I go on, there's one more thing I want to talk about. And that's this. That's dodgy deals. Did you know... For a price to be on sale in a, in a place, um, it has to be on sale at a price for 28 days before you can claim a sale price. So it has to be time limited, it has to be extended. And if they say up to 50% off, at least 10% of the items have to be 50% off for them to say that. That's it. 10% of the items. So 100 items, only 10 of them have to be 50% off. Everything else can be a lesser amount. So bear in mind that just because it says it's a deal doesn't always mean it is a deal. Here, proof. I'll prove it to you. Take a look at this. Can you see the problem here? If you haven't seen the problem here, it's cheaper for me to buy two of these items individually than to buy them for the deal for two for three pounds. Let's have a look at another one. This one here, three cans of refried beans for three pounds or 65p each. I don't even know what to do the math in the chat, but that's definitely not going to be a better deal. Furthermore, things like this, mixed peppers, two for three pound, or 150 each. That's not a deal. However, what might happen here is someone buys both those packets, doesn't need it, and then wastes food. So you can see how the advertising on some of these deals draws our eye, and it might not be a deal. It might just be a way of getting you to spend a little bit more money than you were planning to. So I, in the chat, someone said, swear I've fallen for these. I think we all have at some point, and I'm guilty of it. Uh, and sometimes when you think about sales and saving money, don't think about how much you saved. Think about how much you spent. I didn't save £100 on that TV. I spent £600 on the TV. And remember that end of it. I spent money. Yes, I saved a little bit, but I still spent a lot. And I think that kind of mentality is really good for making sure that you're not spending stupidly high amounts of money on deals that aren't really good for you uh highly recommend if you don't watch it joe lice it uh he did an episode recently about black friday deals showing that they're not normally that good and what they tend to do is when they know black friday is coming up whack up the price for 28 days so that after that they can bring it back down again to their promotional price which then feels like you're getting a great deal and actually if you'd have bought it two months earlier you might have got it cheaper than that as well so just because it says it's a deal doesn't mean it is a deal Finally, I guess the question is, how do I sort this out if I have an issue? Now, number one, people may not know this. If you spend £100 on a credit card and you have a problem with the supplier of the thing you bought, go to your credit card. There is something called Section 75 Protection that you can activate. It's for £100 to £30,000, I believe. Um, and you can then say to them, look, I've had a problem. Can you refund me? And the credit card then picks up the fight. Now, even if you haven't got a credit card, if you've got a debit card, talk to your bank. Some debit card uh, facilities will have a chargeback where the bank will do basically what the credit card company does. The big difference here, Section 75 is law. The chargeback isn't. So the chargeback is based on how nice your bank is. Section 75 is your legal right if you have a credit card and you spent more than £100. In fact, pro tip that I've always used was whenever I book holidays, I always book at least the deposit of more than £100 on a credit card. That way the credit card company can help you later on. 
So that's one way of doing it. Now, you might have to make a complaint. If you look at my Twitter feed, and I don't suggest you do, it's not very exciting, mainly because the only use of my Twitter feed mainly is to make complaints. If I've had bad service, if something hasn't happened, if I need to ask a question directly, I put it on Twitter. And you'll find that that works because companies would la rather deal with things quickly and quietly than have it all public. So, you know, with a level of respect, use, use the social media and use that to get the attention of the, the social media managers who will then pass that on. Uh, it doesn't always work, but it is one route that you might find helps to get someone to actually hear your complaint in the first place. Um, other things, don't say nothing. Say something. Make sure you make a complaint if, you, if you're owed something. Be as quick as you can because there is a time frame. Uh, for example, with faulty goods, if you leave it for six months, now it's on you to prove that it was faulty. If it's within the first six, they've got to prove that it wasn't faulty, and that's much easier for you. So do make sure you do it as quickly as possible. The other option is you should consider using a third-party uh, service. R Resolver is the one that I know of. And Resolver, actually our speaker is from Resolver, so he can explain this better than I can. But Resolver basically helps you make a complaint. Um, does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Really, really smart. Uh, recommended by Money Saving Expert. Um, so yeah, really, really useful tool if you can't be bothered doing all those kind of complaint things yourself. Resolver kind of helps you do it. In terms of some other places you might find useful, here are some websites I'd suggest for this one. Citizen Advice, because actually if you want to report an issue of uh, a breach in the shop, or a service, normally you'd go to trading standards. You have to now report that to Citizen Advice to pass on to trading standards. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. Money Saving Expert has a great guide on how to complain and then Resolver, which is the website we're going to talk about in just a second, which has some great consumer information. And actually one thing I would find on which they've got some great videos about travel and how that's being affected at the moment. Last but not least, there is a government site around protection rights. If you do feel like you have an issue to report, here's how you do it. You can call the Citizen Advice Consumer Helpline. If you need to use a text phone, you've got that option as well. Nine to five, Monday to Friday. They don't open on bank holidays. And if you're in Wales, the numbers are there as well. So if you do need to report an issue, that's how to do it. If you've missed this, go back in the broadcast, pause it, get the numbers you need, make that complaint. Okay, so... That's a, a kind of quick whiz through of consumer rights, but let's get it from the expert now. So let's move into real talk. And today I'm joined by Martin James, who is head of media at Resolver and a consumer rights expert. Martin, how you doing? Hello, Nick. You flew through so much advice there. I'm literally going to really have to work very hard to keep up with all of that. <laughs> Yes, I'm on a timeline, so I've got to condense. But like I say, if, if anyone does feel like it's fast, go back, watch it. That's a wonderful thing about the recording, isn't it? Um, so I guess the first thing to talk about, we mentioned Re Re Resolver in the, the roundup there in terms of the websites. So do you just want to explain a little bit about what the service is, how it works, that kind of stuff? Yeah, no worries. So Resolver is the UK's, and actually I believe the world's biggest free complaints website. So basically, you can make a complaint about pretty much anything. It can be about pet insurance, about parking tickets, about your bank, about all kinds of things. Um, and it's completely free to do. It takes less than five minutes. And it's the same process for absolutely everything. Loads and loads of people say to me that they find the whole process of making a complaint really frustrating, getting hold of someone on the phone. This, you do it all on the website, super quick, super easy. And we've helped sort out over 5.5 million complaints in five years. That's a lot of complaints. And I, I guess that thing about making the journey what we call frictionless, kind of just smooth, is the biggest advantage, I guess. Why, why would I use Resolver rather than just calling up my company and making a direct complaint, I guess? Well, that's a really good question because, you know, anything that usually adds an extra layer to it, so I'm the first person to say it's probably not necessary. But um, Resolve is a little bit different because it actually helps you make an effective complaint. We use this really, really simple process that helps you explain kind of the things that you're struggling with. Loads and loads of complaints don't work because businesses don't listen. And you, when you're trying to make your complaint, you might be angry, you might be upset. And it's very difficult in the moment to get the words out. But I'm here to tell you, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need any kind of, you know, legal or... Um, analytical background to make a, a successful complaint. You just need to tell the firm what's wrong in your own words. And Resolver helps you put that together. And it's also easier for the business to resolve under those circumstances because it knows exactly what you want to sort things out. Yeah, so It's kind of standardizing that process of, this is what I'd like, can you do this? Yes, thanks. And kind of going that back and forth without you having to get bogged down in all the 
I've used it personally. I, I should vouch. I, I've used it personally myself, so I, I, can, I can say it works. So, uh, yeah, I've had good resolution out of it as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about consumer rights in general. Um, I, I guess because I only do a few bits for other media channels, you know, this one's the biggest, obviously. But, you know. um, what sort of things have you been seeing during lockdown that have caused people worries in terms of consumer rights? I talked briefly about holidays. I wonder, is there anything else that are, are you know, trends that you're seeing, perhaps? Well, there certainly is, Nick. I mean, of course, holidays is the big one. It's been super, super busy at my end over the past um, few months. I can um, imagine. But shops is, yeah, exactly. Shops is a major, major one. One of the other areas that we're seeing that's quite interesting is, is things like um, leisure. So things like gyms, dating websites, bizarrely. Um, loads of people are looking at how they can save a bit of cash or they're going online and having a look at their bank accounts, credit cards and realising they're paying for goods or services they don't want or never even authorised in the first place. So we're seeing a massive wave of people seeking refunds, loads of issues with shops and people trying to return goods at the moment. You touched on this before, we can cover it if you like. Um, there's lots and lots of businesses who are ignoring the law at the moment, which I have quite a few things to say about. Oh, yes. Um, but your rights have not changed. I could not agree more. Um, but it is still a little bit tricky with some businesses flouting the rules basically um, you can report them I'm reporting them too so that's happening quite um, quite a bit we're expecting to see a big increase in issues to do with financial difficulties depressingly over the next few months at the moment most of us we might be on furlough you might be getting an additional payment you might have moved back in with the parents or you know you've got your costs down but it is likely that people are going to start struggling a little bit further down the line um, so it's really, really important that everyone knows what their rights are, how to ask for payment holidays and how to fight back if a firm that's lent you money isn't playing fair. Absolutely. And, and I guess if, if you have a concern about those types of things, I and mean, we talked about citizen advice and, and going through that kind of process there, is there anything else you would suggest that people should be doing? Any, any other bodies that we should be talking to? Well, there's a wonderful, wonderful free debt charity called Step Change. Now, they're quite busy at the moment, as you would imagine. But if you have got yourself into financial difficulties and full disclosure, I may do this for a living, but I, too, have been in financial difficulties. And it took me 10 years to pay off my debts. Yeah. Uh, that's what you get for moving to trendy London. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> that cost me a fortune. And, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm not the best with money. I'm, you know, I'm not very good at practicing what I preach. So I do totally know where people are coming from. Um, so Step Change is a free service that can help you manage your debts. It contacts all of the people that you owe money to and it negotiates kind of payment plans at a rate that you can afford. It's not easy, but then anything like this uh, never is. Um, there are other companies that provide debt management services, but they charge fees. And I would strongly recommend that you don't use them. You don't pay more money to get out of the hole. So Step Change is amazing. And all of those sites that you mentioned um, before, there are some great, great bits of advice on there. I often refer back to them to double check. Just, you know, every now and then you have a moment of doubt. Yep. You're not sure if you... <laughs> There's a lot of information out there. Ten, ten minutes cross... before this show is basically that moment of doubt. <laughs> normally, yes. Yeah, exactly. Great. So um, the one thing that I've heard a lot about, and, and actually I was personally affected by this because I should have been in Mexico a month ago, uh, is the summer holidays. And people who have had holidays cancelled or postponed or credit notes issued i mean if people have had their holidays cancelled and been told here's a refund note should they accept that refund note what should we be talking about when we're talking about cancelled holidays okay nick so let's cover the rules and let's cover the reality because i think that's that's what a lot of people are confronting at the moment and um, if you booked a flight and your flight is cancelled in other words it's simply not because you might not want to travel but if your flight has been cancelled then you are entitled to a full refund within seven working days. If you've got a package holiday deal, and it will say, you know, if you've booked something as a package, it generally means if you book your flights and maybe the hotel through the same company, then you're also entitled to a full refund if that's cancelled, and that's a refund within 14 working days. Now, you only have to turn on the telly or listen to the radio or tune into the, uh, these podcasts to know that lots of firms are not following those rules yes and um, what's happened is, is is exactly what you said before nick the what well, i'm i'm a great fan in in you know keeping businesses going and i'd like to go on holiday in the near future and i know if like airlines go under then i'm not going to be able to do it but by that same token a lot of companies have not been honest about the rules and have told people that they're not entitled to have refunds um, and that they that your holiday 
well, you'll just have to go or we'll lose the money. Um, the fact of the matter is the, there's a lot of confusion out there at the moment. Um, some firms simply can't refund because they may well go under. So what I'm generally advising is to be, is to be reasonable. Have a think about what you would like to do um, and what you can afford to do. So imagine if your flight's been cancelled, um, you are entitled to that refund, but would you be willing to kind of move that forward to maybe September, October, or maybe the same time next year, just to see if you can travel then? Because that's always a good idea. Um, or you could potentially take um, a voucher that you could cash in at a different point. Um, there are other issues. We're a bit worried about what happens if firms go bust, but you may still be able to cash in those refunds as well. This is something we're talking to the government about at the moment. There, so there's um, a kind of question about whether if you've booked a package and you get a credit note for that, whether the same package protection applies to the credit note. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm predicting that these will be eventually will become state backed, but they're not at the moment. So do bear in mind that if you do take out a voucher or something, there is still an element of risk. But you are doing a good thing and helping the firm stay in business. Um, however, you are entitled to that refund. And no matter what that airline uh, or holiday company may say, you can you can demand that money back. And there's also a regulator that you can go to. We can help you through resolve against such for them if they're not playing ball. Now, the tricky thing is if you do what I, I do and, and, you know, half the UK does, if you book direct from the hotel or if you go online using a booking website, yeah. these refund rules don't apply. However, the Competitions and Markets Authority, I'm going to try and do this without being boring. Um, they've got, <laughs> they gave a warning, it's a government body, they gave a warning to all businesses, not just holiday companies, that if they don't offer refunds when, when the services are cancelled, like your holiday, yep. then they will take legal action against them. Now, this isn't going to do you any good, unfortunately, because that will take a little while to happen. But it does mean that you can negotiate. So if a firm's playing up, I'd say get in touch with them and put to them some proposals about what would work for you. And if they continue to be difficult, then there are options. You may be able to take the matter further. But it's a very good time to negotiate but be willing to compromise a little bit. I think the interesting thing is, I think we mentioned the CMI going after those kind of companies about two or three weeks ago on, the, on one of the money casts, one of our news pieces. Uh, Beetroot, who I know is here again. Hello, Beetroot. Well, good to see you again. Uh, may well remember we, we, we kind of brought that up really quickly because we thought it was important that people knew that the rules haven't changed because of coronavirus. The rules still, still kind of exist. Um, last one on my list, and, and we'll do this quickly because I'm running out of time, um, is kind of the best tips you could give for being a savvy consumer, especially given we talked, we talked a couple of weeks ago about scams and fake goods. Uh, obviously, with uh, shops opening now, the rules and rights you have when you go shopping, uh, maybe one or two kind of top tips that you would give to our, to our viewers. Definitely. Be cynical is the first one. I don't want to kind of ruin people's days and everything, but look at look at everything like it might be dodgy. So don't necessarily believe online reviews. Double check that a company is legit before you send it your money and only pay using a debit or credit card online if you can. If you send money by any other methods, you've lost it if something goes wrong. So have a healthy, healthy dose of scepticism. Um, do be prepared to shop around as well. And also don't impulse buy. This is where I go wrong. I had drinks and I bought a xylophone the other night. I'm still not quite sure how that happened. But okay. don't buy things straight away. I know it's over there, though. I'm not going to dig it out. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> I might play you out. Um, the, but do uh, shop around. You know, there are things that look like good deals may well not be. So don't impulse purchase. Have a look around. Things are only worth what you are willing to pay. What you said before was so spot on. Have a think about what it is that you would be willing to pay for these goods and don't be impressed by sales. Great. That's brilliant. We're running out of time, so I'm going to move it on. But there, thank you, Martin from Resolver. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to round this up with my three top tips. And I, I don't know how, again, I, I don't know why I do this to myself. I put my top tips after the experts. I might switch that around next week. Uh, so my top tips for this week are, number one, remember the 30-day rule if you have a faulty item. Don't accept anyone telling you to go back to the manufacturer if you bought it from a shop. 30 days, if it goes wrong, take it back to the shop you bought it from. Don't be fobbed off. Number two, buying online might be safer in terms of your rights than buying in store. Um, so do think about that, if, especially if it's something you're not sure you want, that 14-day return period might be something you want to think about instead of going into the shop. And finally, if you think your consumer rights have been breached, contact someone, consumer rights, resolver. Don't sit on it. Don't go and get a haircut, hate it, and pay for it. Speak up for your rights. And as always, 
the more you know about this stuff, the less likely it is to happen to you. So be informed about it. That's going to round us out. Folks, thanks for joining us today for our show. As always, these are our social medias. Feel free to send us a message if you want to or leave it in the chat. You can always send us an email at info at mybank.org if it's about the issues we've talked about today or anything else. Indeed, just send us a message and say hello. Feel free to send it to there. Uh, we are going to be back next week and we are looking at what we call fintech, financial technology, how the world of finances is moving now that technology is getting more and more involved. We'll be talking to someone about how apps work doing some of my favorite apps for making or saving. As always, I've been Nick Smith Patel, Head of Education for Young Adults for my bank, saying thanks very much, stay safe, take care, bye-bye.